I just have to start this episode with a comment from a video earlier today. This is from just me dash Y seven I B. Okay. Just me Y seven I B. I can't figure that all that out. Anyway, he says, Hey, Randy, I found your channel and find it very interesting, but I have found a way how Volkswagen can make more money than Tesla in the near future. They can take the 180 billion they plan to invest in BEVs and buy Tesla stock. <laughs> yeah, had to do that. I just, I, I, yeah. Okay. Anyway, moving right along. The economy continues to percolate along, even as multiple very smart guys try to talk it down. So I've been challenged to do a video that shows what happens to Tesla if we do hit a rough, rough patch in the economy. We actually have a hard landing. Well, I'll give you the short version of that at the end of this episode. This is Randy Kirk. If you haven't, uh, you know, if, like, you always need to like, 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 every time you need to like. If you haven't subscribed yet, you need to subscribe. You definitely want to hit the notify button, which you can't do until you subscribe, because tomorrow I'm doing this video. Okay, um, I did one today. It's, you know, you guys just apparently liked it because it got a huge amount of views. I'm doing one tomorrow that's even more important. I'm going to explain to you how I'm going to get to 21% margins. I'm going to explain to you why I believe it's going to be 21%. Can you imagine what happens to the stock if we hit 21% margins in the second quarter? All right, so that's for tomorrow. You want to hit notify to do that. Patreon, thank you so much. Another couple of people signed up for Patreon today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Keep them coming. We just can't get enough folks on Patreon, and there is now unique contract content on Patreon. All right. So let's start with the general economy and some of the reporting this week. So factory orders missed expectations, okay? But they are still positive. We're not talking about a downturn in terms of factory orders. They are positive, but they were less than they were the month before. Contrasting with that report, however, on Monday, Bloomberg reported the following. I'm just gonna read this out to you. U.S. factory activity contracted contracted, yes, it went down for an eighth month in June, slipping to the weakest level in more than three years as production, employment, and input prices all retreated. The Institute for Supply Management Manufacturers gauge fell to 46. That's the weakest it's been since May of 2020 from 46.9 a month earlier. Now, according to data released Monday, Monday, the current stretch of readings below 50, which indicates shrinking activity, is the longest since 2008-2009. Well, the length of the contraction is not what's important. It's the amount of the contraction. But now all of a sudden you see above that we have um, that the overall factory activity contracted, but it was still positive. So anyway, I think manufacturing is probably doing okay. At the same time, what we're seeing is that construction is up and strong right now. So um, we're again, we're seeing parts of the economy up, parts of the economy down. This is what people have been calling the wave recession. So I'm not terribly worried about it. Um, so um, they go on to say the decline in ISM production gauge, which fell to its lowest level since May of 2020, suggests demand for merchandise remains weak. Well, it means demand for U.S. merchandise remains weak. It may not say anything about uh, uh, imports. The index of new orders contracted for the 10th straight month and order backlog shrank, which may help explain a pullback in a measure of manufacturing employment. Low end uh, retreats to three month low end at 48.1, which indicates fewer producers added to payrolls. So manufacturing has been off and slowing, and, but as mentioned before, construction is up. Anyway, that's, what, that's that report. I think it's important. We do need to pay attention to these aspects which are not always positive, even on my channel. Anyway, so as predicted, the Fed movements did not move the needle on stocks. Told you it wouldn't move the needle. There was nothing new in it. The only thing that was new in it, we'll talk about that in a second, what was new, but we pretty much knew all everything there and it was all baked into the, the, to, to the market. But I'm a little surprised because I thought that this was baked in too. The bond market did respond. In particular, the 10-year was hit pretty hard. The yields are almost back up to 4%. That is now beyond the halfway point of the trading range that bonds, 10-year bonds have been in. So that was a little, uh, you know, a, a, a little breathtaking, if you will. Okay, so 
But what we did learn is how the committee voted. So the committee is now divided. Two of the 18 votes are thinking that we should stop completely. Okay, out of 18, two. It's not very good. 12 of the 18, two thirds, think that we need two hikes or more. So, but that's a lot, it's a long time till September. What this is suggesting to me is we're almost certainly going to get this hike in July, though I think the CPI could still be the reason when the CPI comes out before the next meeting where they're going to make the decision, that CPI could give us a good result. And that could mean we do get a pause again in July. It could happen. Of course, I'm an optimist. You know this is about me. Okay. But um, I think maybe with only 12 out of 18 uh, being that hawkish, uh, a good CPI, and then another good CPI in August, maybe we could stop it for the rest of the for the rest of the year. Nothing going down, for, no, no more up up after this one or increase. Anyway, I, I've pointed out many many times. I don't think it's going to have a dramatic impact. People get used to where the interest rates are. I have been I've lived long enough to see really really high interest rates. I've seen interest rates. A prime interest rates at 12, okay? That's the best interest rate that any corporation could get was 12%. So yeah, we've had high interest rates before. All right, Trueflation says we're at 2.21. That's about as low as it's gotten. Again, it's going straight down like this. I believe Trueflation is giving a real honest look at where inflation is. If in two months, which is usually the lag time between the Fed between Trueflation and the Fed, if in two months they're showing 2.21, 2 we will definitely be paused. I can I can promise you. All right, so oil was up a little bit today. Now, one thing that came to my mind today, I don't know, I mentioned this a couple, few weeks ago, but I kind of forgot about it again until I saw a headline. Keep in mind that oil has other energy sources to compete with other than just solar, wind, and battery. Solar, wind, and battery are taking over, and that means that natural gas and oil are going to lose, okay? Over time, they're going to lose market share and they're going to lose absolute numbers. But natural gas is a straight replacement for oil in many energy applications and in lots and lots of plastics. So when natural gas goes down and when there's tons of natural gas available, then it's in keeping that oil has to, has to respond to that. If oil is too high, and natural gas is, is, is low, then people are gonna switch over to natural gas when they can. When I was in the plastics business, we did this all the time. We'd say, no, I need, you know, here's what I wanna buy right now because natural gas is the better deal. All right, so this is, uh, I, I, I don't think, so oil is still really low. It's still way in the bottom half of its trading pattern. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's trading range. So at 72, 71, I'm still thinking oil is fine. I'd like to see it go back down to 67 personally, but right now it's right in the middle of the trading range. All right, I just read this headline. Tesla's, Tesla's China stellar June results help disperse doubts in the EV sector. Tesla's stellar June results in China help disperse the doubts about the EV sector. Well, okay. I had never really thought about BEVs as a sector. That's important in our overall way of anticipating the direction of Tesla stock. So we have all kinds of different things we think about. We think about the economic macro. We think about what's the NASDAQ doing because basically Tesla fits the NASDAQ better than it does the S&P. We think about the Randy index. That's the what I call the index that I do myself, which is kind of the Kathy Wood stocks, all these risky growth stocks. And I, I created this thing I call the Randy Index, and it's still a real index. They still move kind of together, although now Tesla moves completely different than them, completely different than the NASDAQ as it did today. So then we also have technical factors. We look at those, and then you have the Tesla fundamentals. So you have all these different things to think about. I'm throwing in the BEV as a sector category because it is now something that may move together. It may tend to move together. So we, we need to take a look at that. Is if, if the BEVs in general are doing well, then that's going to affect Tesla. All right. Um, the Tesla Model Y is now the number one selling car in the world. And it's close to being the number one selling vehicle in any market where it is established. Very close. Australia, which is really kind of new to, uh, to the, uh, the Tesla, 
It's now, uh, the Model Y is now number two. There's one last truck that's ahead of it. In France, it's number one. In Sweden, it's number one. In the United Kingdom, it's number one. These are all breaking stories, which some people spend a lot of time on. I'm not interested so much in what's happening in these individual places, although it's fun to watch. I do enjoy seeing those headlines. I'm waiting for later this year when the Model Y becomes the number one best-selling light vehicle in all of the United States and passes all of the trucks. That's going to be a fun day for me. <laughs> That'll be a great one. Okay. Sawyer Barrett says, here's the breakdown of the EVs that General Motors sold in the U.S. in quarter two. They sold of the Bolt. They sold 13,959. This is a discontinued car. 13,000. 959. That's how many they managed to sell. The Lyric, 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 however they're pronouncing it. I would call it Lyric, but I'm not sure how they pronounce it. 1,348 whole cars. Yes, it's true. And then there's the Hummer. They have dramatically increased production on the Hummer. They sold 47 cars so far. Uh, yeah, in quarter two. Um, all right. So yeah, go, 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 General Motors. All right. Meanwhile, Volvo didn't get the memo from General Motors about those being really great numbers. And they didn't get the memo from Volkswagen saying that they don't understand why their numbers are down on BEVs. The people just seem to be disinterested. They didn't, So Volvo, they were reporting in the same markets that Volkswagen sells in, it says their BEV sales were a mere four times what they were last year, same quarter. <laughs> okay. Uh, Volvo, maybe they're making good cars. Maybe they're making, yeah, and maybe they're at the right price and and maybe they look good. Anyway, I'm not sure. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, my streak continues with Tesla in the green again today. I say, I'd say this was a combination of continued happiness over Sunday's numbers and the additional confirmation of 2 million plus cars for the year because of Shanghai's beat. I mean, we're definitely going over 2 million. Are you kidding me? The stock bounced off the recent high. It got up there to the 186-ish. And then um, uh, it bounced back and then it bounced up. And so it's it, it's not a 286 at the end of the day, but it is up a buck in the after hours, even though the market has flattened down. So the market was flattened down today. It's It was flattened down in the after hours and Tesla is up in both instances. Again, this tells me, that the fundamentals, the story is good. People are believing the story. It is the the energy is there. The stock has got motive, uh, momentum, uh, and I think that momentum will, will continue. Now, what could hurt the situation? Well, that would be all of the jobs news that's going to come out over the next two days. Um, if the jobs news is uh, is is rough and hurts the overall market, it will probably also hurt Tesla. So I would say tomorrow we're going to bounce up against that 286 and maybe start to approach, maybe go through it and start to approach 300. If we have bad news on jobs, it'll probably go back down to 265 and trade 265 to 285, waiting for some other news event to stimulate the market and or Tesla back up again. Either one. It could be news on either one right now. If you get good news on the market, Tesla goes up. If you get good news on Tesla itself, Tesla goes up. If you get bad news on either one, Tesla goes down. Not necessarily all the time on the macro because we've seen over and over again where the macro is down and Tesla is up. That's been happening for four or five weeks now. All right, so 300 is definitely in sight, but is really just a jumping off place. And it now appears we could see something over 300 before earnings. I know that's a new number for me. I said we would get to 300 before earnings, but you know, the momentum is there and there's every reason to believe that the value is there. So we will probably see some FOMO before earnings. And especially if people start to believe that the, that these, uh, uh, the uh, what do you call it? The margins will be anything over 20 or 20 or over even 19 would probably be okay. So as to what will happen to Tesla if the economy goes into the ditch, here was my promise at the beginning. I said, I go into this. The simple answer is, is right here. Better than almost Tesla will do better than almost any other company on the planet and way better than any of its peers. I've written a number of books. Well, I haven't written a number of books. I've written two books on recession, one of which was published. I've studied recessions. I can tell you right now, 
Tesla is perfectly positioned for a recession. They have better margins than almost any company with products that cost as much as their products cost. They can cut margins even more than they have easily if they want to keep production up. No other company could do that. They have new products coming out. That's the perfect thing to have happening in a recession. You can always take away market share easier from other companies if you're introducing a new product in a recession. They have mega packs. They're sold out for two years and they're counter recessionary or they're not, they're not the recession proof. But even if they weren't recession proof, they got two years of orders. They have no debt and $22 billion in the bank. In a recession, those who go in strong emerge stronger as their competitors are weakened. So yeah, not to worry. Now the stock, yeah, the stock markets might get slammed around a bit if the if we go into a hard recession. But that assumes that you're in for the short term and you don't care what's going to happen for five five years from now. Most of the listeners are mostly in for the long term. And if you're in for the short term, then I assume that you know how to pick bottoms and tops. Otherwise, you wouldn't be day trading. All right. I did day trading for a year. I only I only made 33 times my investment that year. But man. It was hard on the heart. <laughs> okay. Anyway, got to tell you something. Here's another tip. If you didn't see my video earlier today, you def definitely, uh, whichever side it's on here, you definitely want to go right now. It offers a look at the real valuation of Tesla if Wall Street didn't have their heads buried in the sand. You've never heard anyone explain it like this before. I promise you, the comments that came out afterward tell me that I'm on to something. The numbers are massive. I know I'm an Uber bull, but I'm asking for people to take a look at what I said and tell me where I missed it. I don't think I missed it. I think I was, if anything, I was conservatively looking at potentialities and the numbers are mind boggling because why? Because Tesla is a once in a, once in history. It's a once in history stock, okay? I've also added a short new video on Patreon that is exclusive. Uh, you'll want to take a look at that. I've got another one that'll probably come up uh, probably tomorrow. Um, and uh, that video that's already up there is yet another slant on Tesla's valuation. I think you want to see that. I'll I'll, I'll put this on YouTube uh, probably in a week or so as part of another YouTube show. It won't be all by itself, but it's, it's just another little slant that you might want to take a look at. And of course, right now there's a seven day free trial. So if you want to go see that video, you can Join for free and you don't have to uh, pay for it after the seven days is up. You know, it's only $5 a month. Okay. Now tomorrow I'll be giving my analysis. This is going to happen tomorrow afternoon, right around probably between 11 and one. I'll be giving my analysis on how I get to 21% margins in quarter two. And you're going to want to see that for sure. All right. So hit like, hit subscribe, hit notify if you want to be reminded. And of course I have my morning show every morning. You're going to want to see the morning show, right? I give, I try to do that by 10 minutes this morning. I was 10 minutes after seven. I was late this morning uh, because of some technical issues on my computer, but I was uh, normally trying to 10 minutes after seven Pacific time. So 40 minutes after the market opens, that's when I try to give you the news and my analysis for the rest of the day. Theoretically, that should be just when you need it. It gives me time to take a look at the first 10 to 20 minutes of the market so that I see the direction things are going um, as I'm doing that particular show. So check it out in the morning. Um, love to have you on Patreon. Uh, buy the book. We've got a whole set of books here. You've got the Elon Musk mission, which talks about all the companies. Yes, 20% of it is now dated. It's 300 and something pages. Uh, so it is uh, a lot of it is not dated. About 80% of it is still great. Okay. Totally current information that you will want to have. Uh, the Elon Musk method, if you happen to be an entrepreneur or entrepreneurial oriented or want to be an entrepreneur someday, actually all three other books are designed for entrepreneurs. When Friday Isn't Payday has been out since 1993, selling since 1993. It is now in its third edition. And as you can see on the cover there, Inc. Magazine called it the best small business book of the year in the year it came out. And then uh, Making Money Out of Thin Air, I got together with uh, Shayla Chamberlain. She's a CPA, a, a certified management accountant. She has her MBA. She worked in uh, as a CPA in manufacturing, so real, real life stuff uh, for many, many, many years. Um, and she is incredibly good at what she does. So I asked her to write this book with me. 
And you want to read the book if you have any interest in, in business accounting and how you can make money just from understanding your reports, just from understanding actually both what you put in and what you get out. Both matter. This has been a, a big deal for me my entire life when I've had my own businesses and when I've consulted with others. And then if you read the book and you think Shale is pretty smart, you could always give her a call. She'd be happy to be your CPA. She's She is a client. She is a friend. Uh, but uh, I do this for free. So anyway, uh, the, uh, that's all. That's it. That's all I got for you. And it's been great.